Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us today for our webinar, Building Reliable Data Pipelines for Machine Learning at Safegraph. I'm Brian Durking, Director, Senior Director of Partner Marketing at Databricks. And also with me today is uh, Ryan Fox Squire, who is a data scientist at Safegraph. Hi, Ryan. Hi, thanks for being here. Super excited. Great. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to double check here and make sure that we're seeing our slides and everything. Uh, it's all good. Okay, great. I am actually not seeing the slides here where I am, Norm. Um, Yep, I'm looking at the audience view here. For some reason that's not working. Hang on one moment while I get this sorted. Okay, nonetheless, uh, Ryan, I'll just go ahead and, and work off of uh, my slides and let you know uh, when to forward. Um, so going to uh, the second slide, um, I wanted to take a couple of minutes and introduce everyone to Databricks. Uh, Ryan will be talking about a couple of different things he'll talk about. Um, how SafeGraph is building data pipelines and how they're doing that using Databricks. And then he'll also talk about um, some of the data that they make available as a service uh, that customers can use uh, in order to improve their operations and uh, to further leverage their own data. Um, but a quick thing you know about Databricks, um, Databricks is a unified data analytics platform. Um, you know, we really help uh, organizations solve the world's toughest data problems. Uh, we're a global company. We have over 5,000 customers. Um, and a little bit about the company, our founders are actually the original creators of Apache Spark, which I'm sure that all of you on the call are familiar with. Um, Spark is really the de facto standard uh, and platform for doing any kind of data work, whether you're doing data engineering and ETL work or if you're doing data science. Um, so that's uh, kind of our pedigree. But then uh, the Databricks team has also built and introduced uh, Delta Lake, which has now also uh, been made an open source uh, offering. And then MLflow, which is also uh, another piece that we've introduced and, and made into a, uh, an open source offering. So I'll talk about those a little bit more in one second. Uh, let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about organizations are, are failing to unlock business value. And you probably see numbers all the time uh, about this, You know how only 17% of machine learning and AI uh, projects are, are able to be fielded and stuff. Um, and that's because uh, there are a lot of different limitations that are going on in terms of what's happening inside of data teams and organizations. We have lots of different technologies where folks are using, data scientists are using different IDEs and machine learning frameworks and languages. Um, data engineers are using you know, a completely different set of tools for, for being able to develop uh, their pipelines. And so uh, it becomes difficult for, to bring those folks together to have them uh, collaborate. Um, data quality and reliability can be an issue. You know, quite often we're taking data and we're throwing it into uh, data lakes, and we've been doing it, you know, for the last five years or so, and, and not really looking at how are we going to use that data. It's, it's been more like a parking ground for us. And then we've also got, you know, data coming from a lot of different internal sources, but that data is not coordinated in any way, you know, not, not only structurally, but even in terms of, uh, you know, things like uh, the verbiage that we use to describe, you know, customers or, or products or things like that, you know, those types of things need to be brought together and, and uh, made reliable and consistent. And then we have fragmented security. So we're often, you know, trying to figure out how to get people's the, people the right roles and, and assignments and everything to be able to access this. And so this is what Databricks really solves for organizations is to bring this all together into a unified data analytics platform. Um, so we have a collaborative workspace for data teams to work across the full life cycle. Um, you can work right in our notebooks. Data engineers and data scientists work side by side. They can use their preferred languages. So a data engineer can work in Scala, and a data scientist can be working in Python, and, and that will flow right back and forth. Um, but, you know, the real beauty of it is the collaboration capabilities, the fact that you can leave notes and comments for each other and, and, uh, and you know, be able to communicate through the workbooks. I talk to a lot of customers who look at Databricks and they look at, you know, how high performing it is and, and they buy it for that reason. But when they start to use the collaboration features, they realize that that's a game changer for them, that that becomes 10 times more valuable uh, because it really brings their, their whole teams together. 
Um, at the core of this is Spark. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, our founders were the creators of Spark. This is the underlying engine that, that uh, is being used. And this is really where, you know, the Databricks service was brought uh, to AWS um, and started there. Um, our version of Spark has been tuned, as you would expect, by our experts. Uh, so it's 10 to 100 times faster uh, than any vanilla version of Spark out there. And so that's what really gives us, you know, the huge performance capabilities. Um, and so when I talk about, you know, people solve the, the world's toughest problems using Databricks, it is because uh, of that massive scalability and the ability to, to process, you know, huge amounts of data. Um, I mentioned that we also introduced Delta Lake. So Delta Lake is a service uh, that sits on top of your data lake, uh, which, you know, again, we've probably been throwing data in there for five years plus. Uh, that data is probably not terribly organized. We probably have all sorts of partial data sets and, and junk. Um, Delta sits on top of your data lake and starts refining the data for you. It provides schema enforcement uh, so that you get a, a good uh, schema that then is available for being able to do machine learning and advanced analytics. Um, it also provides other features. Uh, for instance, it does um, uh, asset transactions. So you're able to make sure that as you write a, a transaction that uh, if that fails for any reason, that all the data will be backed back out. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, very cool in terms of being able to make sure you don't have uh, lingering data sets there. Um, it also deals with the fact that you may be writing data at the same time, or you're doing a read while data is being written. Uh, it has rules for being able to take care of those types of things. And, and really, where people use Delta is, um, you know, trying to bring that large volume of data together, and then also quite often. Uh, you may have data that is, is updating and changing very frequently. Um, so if you have data that's coming in from various, uh, you know, web logs or IoT or, or other types of systems, uh, you know, we have some customers who are doing things like intrusion detection and they're, tra they're you know, tracking all the different, um, you know, uh, internet calls that are coming in and network accesses and stuff on their network and then they're, recording those and then doing machine learning against that to try and identify uh, any outliers. Um, so, you know, a huge volume of data moving very quickly um, and that's able to be solved with Delta Lake. Um, so that's been a big part of, of what we've been doing here in terms of uh, the customers that are, are being able to now access all the data that lives in their data lake and then all the data that lives in their, their various applications inside of their organization um, and make that you know, part of their successful uh, machine learning pipelines. In the data science workspace up above, um, you see ML flow. Um, so some of these, you know, again, what we're doing is we're taking a lot of things that people would do by hand in terms of uh, DevOps type work, spinning up clusters and, and automating that, you know, with auto, the auto ability to, to set up all those types of clusters and then manage clusters up and down as your requirements uh, change, um, being able to bring clusters down, you know, once your work stops so you're not being billed for it. Um, MLflow actually automates your entire machine learning lifecycle. So something that you might be tracking now in spreadsheets in terms of different experiments that you run and, uh, you know, what version of a, of a certain library and which data set did you run uh, so that you can recreate after you've run 50 experiments and you decide that, oh, number 16 was the best result. I want to recreate that. Um, MLflow automates all of that for you. And then you see here the ML runtime. Um, so as part of, of what goes on in Databricks, uh, as you spin up clusters and select clusters, you can also choose to run various uh, machine learning uh, frameworks in there. So if you wanted to, besides using Spark, also be able to do work in TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn or Keras or Horovod, um, you could also run those other libraries. And the nice thing about that is as you're doing a, a set of experiments, you can run multiple different machine learning frameworks and be able to see your results across those different frameworks and then choose which one makes the most sense for you. Um, but you're not having to uh, manage setting up each of those frameworks, making sure you get the right versions, et cetera, and, and having that all managed uh, you know, for you automatically in Databricks. But then also being able to say when you go into production, oh yeah, this is exactly the version that we ran. This is exactly what we want to run in production so we get the same results. So it makes it much easier to convey that then um, and make that available uh, going into production. Um, all this is running and, and highly integrated with, uh, with AWS in terms of uh, security, in terms of roles. Um, so that's something that we'll talk a little bit more here about in the next slide, but then we also have a number of different uh, security uh, certifications, and so you can see that there. Um, 
If we go to the next slide here, you can see Databricks on AWS and a number of the different services that we integrate with. Um, so with Glue for being able to do cataloging, uh, being able to take data that we're managing in Delta Lake, make that available to Glue so other services can access it. Um, Delta Lake is sitting right on top of S3. Um, so that's, you know, able to, to take your, your existing um, storage there and, and be able to run uh, right on top of your data lake. Um, working with Kinesis for, for streaming data and bringing that in. Um, Redshift, SageMaker, um, you know, DynamoDB, Athena, um, AWS Directory Services. All these things are integrated right out of the box. And we have documentation and we have uh, blog posts that talk about how you, you bring all these things together. Um, but the nice thing is that as you're running on AWS, um, this is integrated with those various services. Um, okay, one last slide here. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the AWS Data Exchange. Um, this is something that was announced uh, a couple of weeks before reInvent, um, and this is something that SafeGraph and Databricks are both participating in. Um, so AWS has introduced this data exchange. Um, this allows you to go and look for uh, data sets that you might want to run um, against your data. Um, and in the case of SafeGraph, uh, if you want to run their data, one of the things is that we have uh, worked together to build out a notebook that pre-integrates uh, SafeGraph data. So that way, if you wanted to run this and try that out, um, you can go ahead and get Databricks, you can get the SafeGraph data, you can go ahead and bring that together and you can start working with your own data and, and pairing that up. Uh, but, but these data exchange is a great way to be able to go and, and find these data sets, be able to set up uh, your integration with them, uh, be able to make sure that you get updates as the data changes. Um, so those are some of the things I just wanted to cover, and at this point, I will turn it over to Ryan. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll, and I'll, at the end of this presentation, I'll also talk a little bit more about the AWS Data Exchange and how you can get that notebook um, and show some of that. So, uh, you know, hang tight for that as well. Um, so, so again, my name is Ryan Squire. I'm a data scientist at SafeGraph. Uh, also, a lot of the work I'm showing here today was produced by my colleague, Noe Yannick. Um, but yeah, we're super excited to be here. We, you know, we, SafeGraph, we're big fans of Databricks. We use Databricks every day for ad hoc analysis, prototyping, as, as well as many of our production pipelines. Um, so really a privilege to get to, to be here and share some of that with you today. Uh, so I have a lot of great content to talk about. Um, and the presentation is basically divided into these three, these three sections. So, First, I'm going to explain just what is SafeGraph, uh, what, what you can do with SafeGraph data so that you have sufficient context for the rest of the talk. Then I'll go through what is essentially a case study of what not to do when building ML pipelines, and then ultimately how Databricks helped us solve some of these internal technical challenges. And then finally, I'm just gonna highlight some of the collaborations we've been doing with Databricks and AWS uh, related to that AWS data exchange, ultimately to try to bring more value to our end customers um, you know, there are, these are customers that use both SafeGraph and Databricks together, and so we'll show some some examples of sort of how that's uh, easier than ever. So, uh, so yeah, I'll start by just talking about you know what what is SafeGraph. So the most important thing to understand about SafeGraph is that we are just a data company. All we do is sell you data, uh, typically as CSVs. Uh, so we don't build software. We don't, you know, we don't build software solutions or software products. We don't do analytics or make analytic products. We're just 100% focused on providing our customers accurate, accurate and reliable data so that they are the ones that can build these awesome software products or these awesome analytic products. Um, and we also partner with these top sort of data science platforms like Databricks to make this uh, easier for them to work with the data inside those platforms and, and whatever their day-to-day -day workflows are. And you know, we think this is an important uh, mission because today data is more valuable than ever. Uh, AI and ML and, and data science applications are growing rapidly and all those applications rely uh, on access to high quality data. So our mission is to power innovation through open access to geospatial data. And we believe that data should be a, an open platform, not a trade secret. So we want to live in a world where if you have a good idea for how to use data, then there should be a way for you to get that data. Uh, the SafeGraph team is based in San Francisco. Uh, we're a group of data engineers, data scientists, and data business experts. Uh, we've been working on SafeGraph for almost four years. 
Uh, and if you've heard of the company LiveRamp, um, our CEO and founder, Orrin Hoffman, was previously the founder and CEO of LiveRamp. So we have a lot of experience uh, with data and, and privacy that carries over to our work here at SafeGraph. And so we think of SafeGraph as the source of truth for physical places. I, I told you that SafeGraph is a geospatial data company. Um, what, does that what does that really mean? So basically it means that we build data sets about points of interests or physical places, and we're 100% focused on making those data sets uh, as completely accurate as possible. Today, our data set covers over 6 million points of interest in the US and Canada, and we're primarily focused on all the commercial businesses where consumers can physically go and spend money or spend time. So all of the restaurants, all of the retail shops, grocery stores, movie theaters, hotels, airports, parks, hardware stores, nail salons, bars, all, you know, all these places where uh, a consumer could physically go there, uh, those, those are gonna be in our, in our data set. Um, and understanding the physical world and having accurate data about points of interest has a wide range of applications. So I've just listed some of these top customer use cases of SafeGraph data today, although this is not comprehensive. Uh, so you know, SafeGraph data helps people who are working in retail and real estate, um, you know, ad tech and marketing applications, uh, GIS applications like mapping software or, or consulting services. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about all these different use cases today, but if you're curious about any of these, please feel free to ask a question through the webinar um, and I can elaborate on any of these at the end um, or provide more information after the webinar. So in particular, today I'm gonna to be talking a lot about uh, re retail and real estate, and I'll go deeper into that in a few minutes. Um, but the point is that accurate POI data touches a wide range of use cases, and we are extremely proud of our partners and customers that, that we've that we work with today, I listed a few of them here. As I said, our customers range from retail analytics and real estate firms, uh, consulting firms like KPMG, advertising, targeting, and attribution technology companies, uh, geospatial analytics platforms like Esri. Okay, so I've given you a sense of the types of problems that we're helping people solve. Uh, let me make this a bit more concrete uh, and explain how, how we're actually helping them, you know, what, what actually are our products. So as I said, SafeGraph is the source of truth for physical places, and we're just a data company. Uh, and we summarize the physical world in, in three data sets. Uh, but each of these data sets can be easily joined together. They sort of share the same primary key, which is a unique uh, point of interest ID that we call the SafeGraph place ID. So you can think of each of these data sets as, you know, one row per point of interest. Uh, and they have different columns and different attributes. Uh, so the sort of the, the foundational data set is what we call core places. This is all of your foundational metadata about a place, like its name, its address, phone number, category information. Does it belong to a major corporate brand or chain? Th things like that. Geometries is all of the essential geospatial data about that place. So for example, it's location in latitude longitude coordinates as a point or what is the actual you know, two-dimensional shape of that building's footprint as a polygon. We also include spatial hierarchy information. For example, is this POI inside another POI, like uh, you know, a, a store inside a, inside a mall, for example. And finally, patterns data uh, is all about understanding human movement around these, P these POI. Um, you know, it's essentially summaries of foot traffic visiting these different points of interest uh, so that you can get a, a picture of who's actually coming to these places um, and where they're coming from. So, so Patterns is the main product that I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk. So let me just give a little bit more information about what Patterns actually is. So Patterns, the goal of Patterns is to provide powerful insights into consumer behavior. Um, again, it's, it's all about summarizing human movement or foot traffic to points of interest. And it's keyed on the SafeGraph place ID so that you can easily join it to these other data sets. It's totally anonymized and, ag and then aggregated. So the idea is that we've designed this to be both easy to use for the end user because it's, it's an aggregated data set, so it's, it's not very large. And also it's, it's very privacy safe and, and privacy intentional in terms of the way it's been built um, so that there's no individual devices in the, in the data that's all, it's all aggregated counts, things like that. Um, but it's derived from a panel of 46 million or so anonymized devices visiting 
you know, over three and a half million points of interest in the United States uh, every month. Uh, and, you know, we hope we try to make it easy to use. And again, you just download, download this as a CSV. So patterns data can answer questions like, you know, on average, in aggregate, how many people are visiting a location or an on average, where do people come from when they visit, or what are their sort of home origin census areas? Um, how long do they visit when they're there? Are these short visits? Are these long, long dwells? Um, as well as things like where else do they go? So what is sort of the common cross shopping behavior of people that go to POIA? What other types of brands or stores do they go to? Um, and so sort of in this, in this final slide for this section, I just wanted to make patterns sort of bring this together in the, with, a, with an example. Um, so, so in this example, you know, imagine that you're a major retail chain and you're considering opening a location at an outdoor mall uh, located in downtown San Diego, indicated by this, uh, this S here. So opening a, a new location is a huge investment, right, for these, for these companies. It has a huge risk. Uh, and so you, you want to know as much as possible to predict how successful this new location is going to be for your business. And so not only can SafeGraph data tell you about the identity and location of all of the other neighboring businesses in this area, you know, whether these are things that are competitive to you or complementary to you. Uh, but Safeguard Patterns also gives you a picture of the, of the foot traffic and, and human movement around and visiting this mall. And so in this visualization, as I said, the S is the, is the candidate site. Uh, all these different colors, these different polygons represent different census areas that have different demographics for the people that live there based on the census data. So things like uh, race and income and, and age and things like that. And these red cones, uh, the height of these cones represent how many people visited this mall. And the location of the cone represents the, the home census area for, for those devices that visited. Uh, and again, this is all anonymized aggregated data. So we don't know anything about these visitors other than the sort of average demographics of their home census area. But this is a super interesting picture because traditionally, when considering real estate opportunities in the retail world, it's common to analyze sort of the immediate surrounding area of your, of your site to make a demographic model of the sort of potential customers. Um, but in this example, SafeGraph Patterns data is showing you that there also are these distinct areas in, in the north and the southeast uh, that are driving a lot of visits to this downtown mall. Presumably, these are people who are sort of driving in to, to go to this mall in downtown San Diego. Uh, and so there's a lot more there's a lot more to the story, but the point is that if you were basing your analysis only off of sort of the immediate census areas, um, you would have instead of the actual foot traffic tra traffic data, um, then you'd have an incomplete and actually incorrect picture of what's going on in this particular real estate opportunity for your business. So again, this is just trying to give you a sense of the types of questions that people are able to answer with SafeGraph data. Um, okay, great. So so. That was sort of the deep dive in what, what SafeGraph is and, and what we do. Um, so now let me, let me turn to this sort of next section, which is all about SafeGraph as a customer of Databricks, um, where we were trying to build machine learning pipelines and, and sort of struggling to do that. Um, so so, so the, t the title of this section is Machine Learning Pipelines at Scale to Construct SafeGraph Patterns. Uh, but an alternative title to this section could have been a story of hubris, pain, and enlightenment. Um, so, so I hope I hope I hope you learned something from from our from our follies here. Uh, so, let me just set up the problem. So, <clears throat> what is the actual technical problem that we were trying to solve? So, an end user of SafeGraph patterns should be able to answer questions like, "Did total footfall to McDonald's change from Q2 to Q3?" Um, or, or like the example I just showed, right? What fraction of visitors to the San Diego Mall are from North County, San Diego? Things like that. Um, from the perspective of SafeGraph, uh, this is basically what the problem is for us. So, so we're partnered directly with mobile applications um, on, on iOS and Android that use location data as part of the value of their service. Those applications anonymize those data and send them to us, and essentially they're going to. D deposit it in an S3 bucket that we read from. And these are essentially time series of GPS points with anonymous device IDs. And so we want to find clusters of these points in time, indicating that a visit has occurred. And then we want to match those clusters to the correct point of interest using our, our core places and geometry data um, 
to sort of produce a list of, of visits uh, across time. So, so the end product here is, you know, one row for every visit. So we say, you know, you know device X visited Starbucks and then device visited McDonald's. And uh, to go from here to, he to our final product is, is sort of a simple aggregation. <clears throat> so the hard part really is doing this, uh, this matching together. And this turns out to be a fairly nuanced challenge. Uh, and the reason is that this has to do a lot with sort of the noisiness of, of, of GPS data. So here's an example of a cluster of GPS points um, that were sort of spread out across, you know, 30 minutes or so. And as you can see, I've labeled six businesses that are nearby this cluster. And, you know, we, again, SafeGraph has the polygon data for each of these businesses. So, for example, this structure has two different businesses in it, and I've highlighted one of them in green. Um, and we have all these different businesses and shapes. Uh, and the point here is that the GPS data is not absolutely precise. Sometimes it can be very noisy, especially, especially during uh, in, in dense urban environments or uh, in, in when, when, once, you, once the device goes inside to a building. Um, and in addition, right, the, the GPS data is not fully precise. There's sort of an uncertainty radius around each point. So the data really looks more like this. And um, and so you can sort of imagine, you know, if you were a human <laughs> approaching this problem, right? You can sort of develop heuristics for how you might try to decide which POI uh, this this cluster of points actually visited, right? You could imagine engineering features, things like what's the distance from the center of this cluster to the different POIs, and maybe it maybe it visited the closest one, or which you know closest to the closest point. Uh, we also look at things like. What time of day is it? Because we know that certain types of businesses are more likely to be visited during certain types of days, and so that also helps um, decide as like between between different options. Um, and so the main takeaway point here is that this is a great problem for machine learning because there are many different small factors at play here, and it's hard to keep track of them um, sort of all in in your in your head at once. But um, you know, if we can engineer these features, then we can uh, hopefully build a, a compelling model to do this. And, and so ultimately, visits are the way we've formulated the visits problem is that it's, it's a large scale preference learning problem or, or like a learning to rank type model. Um, and the reason that it's not sort of just a straightforward classification is that uh, if we treated each of these sort of POI as a classification, like did it visit or not, we'd actually be throwing away some information because we know that uh, it's really a relative choice between these options. And so, uh, it, it's not just the case that D didn't visit, but or that, that, that the visit wasn't to location D, but that uh, the location to visit A looks much more compelling than the location to visit D. And so essentially we, the way we structure this model is it's a bunch of comparisons between different options and the models trying to classify between these different options, which one's the better one. And then ultimately we have sort of the highest ranked option to pick to select. Um, so. I'm not going to go into more details about the model. If you want to learn more about the details of how this works, we've, we've actually published an extensive white paper on how we built this model. Um, because again, many of our customers are sort of trying to do this themselves. So this isn't something that we're sort of trying to hide and keep proprietary. We want you know, our customers who, use, who buy our geometry data, geometry data to do this, uh, to be as enabled as possible. Um, but so, if, so, so all you really need to understand going forward is that this is a machine learning problem. And if you didn't follow the details, that's OK. You can imagine this is any generic machine learning problem going forward. Um, but the point is that you know I had this idea of this model that I wanted to try to build, and so I wanted I wanted to go sol solve it. And so this is where um, the the sort of hubris and pain come in. So uh, in my mind, I was like, okay, I I'm going to start by just doing the simplest thing I could imagine, which is I'll I'll do it I'll do it locally, uh, and I'll try to do it in a Jupyter notebook on my computer uh, using SK Learn, and so. Um, my stack basically looked like this. So uh, the, the data is originally on S3, and I just downloaded the data to my to my to my laptop, and then I opened it in a Jupyter notebook. And um, this was like a terrible idea, right? So um, the data is is quite large. Um, the, the movement data can be as big as a terabyte per day. Um, my computer starts starts failing on 300 megabytes of, of the training data, um, and so. Uh, essentially, like the, the first lesson here is if 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 your MacBook Pro is part of your data pipeline, um, you've you've made a mistake. <laughs> so you know, look at your life, look at your choices, 
and maybe don't tell anyone that you thought this was going to work and and let's move on so uh the the next thing i was going to try was um okay i'm not going to do it locally but um maybe maybe i just needed a bigger machine right so instead of doing it on my laptop i'm going to do it on a, a big cloud instance a big ec2 box um it's going to have way more memory so so maybe this will work uh again so so my stack is uh i'm going to download the data from s3 onto this big cloud instance and i'm going to run jupyter notebooks on this cloud instance uh and um you know so so, so how did this how did this work so i spent a day building the notebook to train this model uh and uh you know i feel like i learned my lesson last time so this time i start by training it only on one percent of the training data just to make sure everything's working um and it's you know it, it's very slow it takes many hours but it works uh i'm able to train the model uh, and so then I, so then I'm, I, I increase the data size and, uh, that crashes the box. Uh, of course I didn't save my notebook off of the box. So I just lose my notebook completely. And, um, you know, in my one-on-one -on -one that week, I just tell my manager that I'm working on it. And, uh, the, the lesson, lesson number two here is, um, you know, this is a bad idea and it doesn't work. So it's, the, it's that perfect combination. Uh, okay. So back to the drawing board. Um, so, so, that, so now I'm like, okay. It sounds like I should try to do something in some sort of dis distributed context. Um, you know, smart people are using distributed processes. I should I should try that. Uh, so my plan is okay. I'm going to train the SKLearn model on a, on a Databricks notebook on a Spark cluster, and then to run the model, I'll just map partitions the, the model with PySpark. You know, across one terabyte of data. So okay, this is starting to look a little bit more promising, right? I'm I'm using Spark now and, and Databricks. Uh, and the, the training works, okay, so I'm able to fit the model, but uh, when I try to run the model sort of in production on, on our full data, it's, it's just way too slow. Um, you know, doing a day's worth of visits uh, takes more than a day to do, and it costs a lot of money to run this big Spark cluster, um, and we have to run this every day, so this is just sort of, you know, non-functional, non and, and essentially, there's two huge bottlenecks with this approach. First is... I'm doing all the pre-processing of data in PySpark, uh, which turns out to just be extremely slow. Um, as, as I'm sure many of you know, right, the, the, the PySpark versus Scala, one of, one of those core issues is that um, if you're trying to push a lot of data through PySpark, it, it's just going to run much slower. Um, and, and then the second issue is that uh, even though I'm running this on a cluster, I'm still ultimately using a scikit-learn model that's, that's single-threaded. Um, and so I'm not able to really take advantage of any of the sort of the true sparkness of this approach, which is, you know, the, the multi-threaded sort of fully paralyzed approach. Um, so, so both of those reasons are really slowing me down. Um, and really, this just is not how machine learning should be done in 2019, uh, let alone 2020, right? We have all these great tools now to solve these problems, as I was slowly realizing. Um, and so the lesson number three here is, uh, you know, this, this approach is sort of like a poor, a poor, a bad, a bad relationship, right? Like I'm, I'm, I still, I'm trying to do the spark stuff, but I still have one foot in sort of my single threaded scikit learn model. I'm just not committed. Um, and so, so after this, I was like, okay, I really need to, I really need to make, make a full commitment here and, and, and do this, do this right. Uh, and so, Ryan. yeah, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. This is hilarious. I just love how you're approaching this. Uh, <laughs> we, we have a couple of questions that I thought I, I, poke in real quick because I think they're really relevant to right where you're at. Uh, oh, great. One question Thank you. Was, um, yeah. How big is the data set that you were trying to train the model on? Yeah, I great. So uh, over a terabyte. Yeah. And I, I skipped over this slide, but I'll just jump back to it really quick um, to explain sort of the context of the data. So um, when I say it's large scale, this is sort of what we're working with. So the, the GPS data is about a terabyte of data per day. Um, our core place in geometry data, you know, it's, it's not a huge data set, although it's not, it's not trivial either. The geometry files uh, can be pretty rich. Uh, and ultimately, when we sort of run this, you know, we, we don't know this ahead of time, but ultimately we're getting around 30 to 40 million visits per day. So these, you know, 40 million different clusters that we're then matching to 5 million different places. Um, so the end result's about 10, 10 gigabytes. So, so this is sort of the benchmark for how big the data is. Cool. Okay. And then another question that came up was... Uh, as you're using, you know, um, Scala in the first two stages, but then PySpark, um, and the question was, why don't you just do everything in Scala? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. And essentially, uh, the the answer to that is that I personally 
like doing machine learning in Python more than Scala. And so I was, mm -hmm. as you could, as you could see, I was very resistant to moving everything over to Scala because just for my own preference. Um, but ultimately, right, Scala had a ton, ton of these advantages. Um, and so actually that's a great transition into my sort of final um, sort of enlightenment cool. slide here. Um, right. So, so, so yeah, let me, let me explain sort of what the sort of final, um, you know, the, the way we were able to finally solve this. Uh, and, and that also highlights this issue around the sort of Scala versus Spark thing. So, so ultimately, um, right now, now, now the stack's looking really good, right? We're, we're feeling, um, we're feeling happy about this. This is, this is all the technologies that we'd like to use. Uh, you don't see, you don't see scikit-learn on here anymore. Um, and we're, we're now using the Spark ML libraries to, to actually do the machine learning. Um, we have this set up as three different, uh, different jobs sort of separate the concerns. So there's a, there's a job that runs to do the clustering. Um, there's a job that then does the spatial joins between those clusters and the places. So this is sort of all the pre-processing data that was really slow in PySpark. We now do this in Scala. And then the final step where I actually am using the machine learning model to, to do the predictions, I'm still running that in PySpark. Uh, and again, that's just because I had a slight preference to use PySpark and I was uh, it turned out that the really slow steps were around the data processing, but not the actual model scoring itself. And so I was able to still, still use PySpark in this final step. Um, but again, that was just because it worked and I didn't need to optimize it further. Um, the, the real slowdown with PySpark was in, around sort of the, the big data processing and, and being able to bring it smaller. Um, you know, then we're scoring, you know, 50 million or so, so uh, data points here. So, um, right, so I'm able, to, I'm able to train and fit the data in PySpark able to run these jobs. Now these jobs are set up with this beautiful airflow um, coordination system that runs them every morning. Uh, uh, I get, oh, like, like I just said, the first two of these are in Scala, and then the, the final one is in, in PySpark. Um, and, you know, this was just like a world of difference, right? Like now the processing time is in an order of magnitudes faster. Uh, the model takes 30 minutes to train uh, on, you know, the full, the full terabytes of data. Uh, whereas before it was taking me many hours to just do a subset of the data. Um, so, so again, right. The, the key, the key thing here is, uh, there's, there's reasons that we've developed these technologies and they, they really do make a world of difference when you, when you incorporate them into your, into your stack. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll just pause there again, Brian, if you thought there were any other relevant questions that were worth jumping in here now, or, or if, um, if I should move forward. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and roll. I, I see a couple of things, but I think we'll save a couple of these for the end. So uh, feel free great. to proceed. Okay, great, awesome, um, cool. That's right. So so problem solved again. Right, we were bringing this big these big data sets together, trying to do these sort of complicated merges and machine learning scoring, uh, and ultimately this was a great problem to be solved uh, with Spark. And and if you're going to do that, then really you know really commit to it and go all the way because it's worth it's worth doing. Um, and I just wanted to call out here that, uh, you know, so, so I finally figured out how to make patterns. Uh, it was a big effort of the team. Um, if you want to play with some of the data, so the, be, be an end user of the data, uh, you can download some of this data from our website, shop.safegraph.com. Um, feel free to use this coupon code. Uh, you're strongly encouraged to do so. Data for Databricks fans, that'll give you a thousand free rows, a uh, hundred dollars worth of data from, from the pattern. So. Uh, if you want to check this out, maybe for your local area or for your favorite, um, you know, restaurant chain or whatever, uh, definitely encourage you to, to check that out. Um, great. So, so that sort of concludes the second section to talk about Safegraph as a customer of Databricks. Uh, I hope that you were able to learn something from our from our follies here. Uh, and then the final section that I'm going to talk about is uh, changing changing gears a little bit uh, to talk about how you as an end user can benefit from Safegraph. Uh, partnering with Databricks and AWS, um, as Brian was mentioning at the top, through this AWS Data Exchange program, uh, and and this is sort of going to be about uh, an example of using SafeGraph data to answer some consumer retail behavior analytics questions. Uh, and again, um, you know, the, the goal here is to really enable you guys to do this yourselves. So, <clears throat> uh, again, I'll just I just put the slide up to remind us. Right, there are many uh, many use cases of SafeGraph data. Um, across different verticals. Um, the, the, the example I'm about to talk about is going to be in the retail real estate uh, bucket, but um, you could certainly adapt these notebooks to answer other questions for, for your area of interest. Um, 
So this is this is just I screenshotted some of our blog posts from a few weeks ago when this when this partnership was announced and AWS launched the the, the data exchange, as Brian mentioned at the top of the presentation. Um, where we think of this as sort of a full stack location solution because uh, SafeGraph brings the data uh, and Databricks brings the sort of analytic horsepower, right? So if you only had one or the other, you wouldn't really be able to answer many questions, right? You could have lots of SafeGraph data, but if you didn't know, if you didn't have tools to work with it, it's not very helpful. Um, vice versa, you could have the Databricks platform, but if you don't have any data to work with, it's not very useful. Uh, and, and so the AWS Data Exchange makes this partnership really easy for you to uh, get the SafeGraph data sort of seamlessly integrated into Databricks. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to check out the AWS Marketplace, uh, definitely check it out. Um, you can search for SafeGraph there, and we have you know 20 plus data sets available. I'd like to call out particularly that many of these data sets we put on there are just for free. So uh, you don't have to buy anything. You can just go to the market, uh, the market, uh, the marketplace and data exchange and uh, search for SafeGraph and put the word free in here, and you'll find some of our free data sets. And uh, again, these are seamlessly integrated with Databricks, and we wanted to make that as easy as possible for you guys. So um, well, we've made a notebook, like Brian mentioned, <clears throat> that uh, sort of shows exactly how this works. And and this example, uh, is you can fully reproduce yourself because it uses only free data from the marketplace, from, from the data exchange. Um, and I'll just briefly um, jump out of here to show you what this link looks like. So uh, this is kind of a hard link to <laughs> transcribe, but um, I'll, I'll give you another link to, for the blog at the end that you can find this from. Um, but again, this is just a Databricks notebook, so hopefully this looks comfortable and familiar to you guys. Um, if, you, if you import this notebook, you're going to have a little widget at the top here uh, that lets you copy-paste an S3 bucket. And again, this, this notebook was designed to let you hit the ground running uh, using SafeGraph data from AWS inside the Databricks platform. And the first half of this notebook is essentially showing you how to load in the data using some of this, some of the great Databricks technology like Delta Lake. Uh, and again, this works really easily with AWS because <clears throat> once you sort of subscribe to the data in the data exchange, then you can essentially just point this notebook at that bucket, and it just works. And then the second half of this is um, just showing some sort of first order questions and analytics that you can do with this data. Um, even just using sort of Spark SQL, so so nothing nothing fancy, just very very straightforward to try to give you some context of how this works. So you you can get this notebook to have all this in here. Um, I'm not going to go through the notebook detailed here. I'm going to just jump back into my slides um, and just show you some of these examples as, as screenshots. Um, and so so here so here's an example, right? So so this is. Uh, you know, this is Spark SQL, right? You're you're reading from these temp tables that you've created that are that are literally just copies of the CSVs that you're getting from SafeGraph, and uh, it's a fairly simple query. This query is going to show you the hour by hour foot traffic for we just randomly selected 20 Starbucks uh, in the data set, and so on the x-axis here is the hour of the day, uh, and uh, you can see that you know across the day. The visits to, to to Starbucks ramp up uh, and then ramp back down, uh, but there's also interesting variation between between the different Starbuckses, and some of them have, you know, big peaks and big troughs, and some of them are much more flat. Um, you know, the the screen one appears to be some sort of 24-hour Starbucks that has fairly common traffic uh, throughout the day and 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 the night, um, things like that. Uh, you know, this this could be interesting to you if, for example, you were considering opening uh, a store in a particular location and you're trying to understand. Um, you know, look, look, let me look at the other businesses nearby. Are they doing a lot of lunchtime traffic? Are they doing a lot of evening traffic? Um, which of those is relevant for my business? Things like that. Um, this is the exact same thing, but now showed by day of the week. And so I think this is kind of fun because, again, we've selected 20 random Starbucks. Uh, most Starbucks have fairly common traffic throughout the day, the week, and the weekend. But a few of these Starbucks really drop off on the, on the weekend. Uh, and again, you know, this, this is sort of raw data about what sort of foot traffic you'd expect in certain areas and to certain businesses. Um, you know, these are things that uh, are hard to quantify other ways. Um, but traditionally, re retail stores will, for example, go send people to stand at street corners to count people across a week and things like that. Safegraph data sort of automates all that for you. Um, 
I wanted to highlight another dimension to patterns data, which is about cross-brand shopping patterns. Uh, again, this is a relatively simple query on the SafeGraph data. Uh, one of the things that we do is we summarize for every given place, what are the top common brands that people that visit this POI also visit, right? So maybe you visit a particular Starbucks. Uh, in this case, you know we're looking at people that visit Starbucks and we're saying, what are the other top brands that people who visit Starbucks also visit? Uh, and we've broken this down by California, Texas, and New York. And we you know one thing that's interesting is that cross-brand shopping patterns are very regional specific, right? Obviously, like your patterns are going to depend on what's what's available to you. And so, uh, across these three states, the only sort of common top shared cross-brand is McDonald's. Um, the other the other top common cross-shopped brands are different in New York uh, versus te Texas versus California. Um, Right, and again, these are these are these are out of the box visualizations from Databricks in the Databricks notebook. Right, uh, it makes it super easy, um, very straightforward. Obviously, you could you could elaborate on this quite a lot um, and do more sophisticated analysis, but um, the goal here is just to really make, get it into your own hands easily and show you how quickly you can do these these types of things. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to show was, you know, really how powerful this can be. Uh, I don't have the I don't have the whole query written here, but um, as I said, as, as I showed in that example with the red cones, you can infer demographic information about visitors based on their home census block groups. And uh, in this case, right, we can do an analysis where we bring in the census data, which is also available through the, the, the AWS data exchange. You can join it to our patterns data through the census block group ID. And then you can build an aggregate, what are, in, you know, on average, based on where people are coming from, what are the different, what's the, what's the demographic profile of people that visit Starbucks? Um, and in this case, I've compared it to just the the full, the full U.S. population, and uh, you know I think this is super interesting, right? Because uh, although these look generally the same at, at a high level, there's actually some really important differences. And our data is showing that uh, people that visit Starbucks on average um, are are less likely to live in 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 census block groups that have African American populations, right? So the, so the the demographics of Starbucks is smaller for African Americans compared to the average U.S. population. It's bigger for Asian and um, white white populations. So, again, these are all on average in aggregate, uh, but ultimately you can pull out very powerful um, insights from this. And uh, I, I don't show it here, but you can also do very rigorous statistics around this as well. So, um, you know, there's no confidence intervals here, but but that's that's super possible with the data as well, depending on what you what you really care about. Um, Great. So, so again, the goal of this section was just to give you a sense of I can use SafeGraph data in my own hands very easily in Databricks. We've tried to make it super easy. Uh, we're super excited about the partnership because you know we know that we have many customers that use Databricks as part of their day-to-day -day workflows, and making the data easy for them to use in Databricks is just like a win-win for us. Um, so again, I'll just sort of summarize all, all the content that I went through here today. Um, you know, the first the first takeaway is SafeGraph is the source of truth about the physical world. Um, you know, we have use cases in retail, real estate, ad tech, GIS, uh, and more. Um, the second section was all about how do we actually use Databricks to run our machine learning pipelines uh, to build the patterns product that I was just talking about. Um, ultimately, our ability to do that depends on Databricks, uh, and I encourage you not to repeat my mistakes. Um, I, hope, I hope you guys learned something or at least were entertained by our, our failures. <laughs> um, and then the third bullet point here is that SafeGraph data is available right now um, for free or for purchase on the AWS Data Exchange. And you can use our Databricks notebook and have these insights you know, literally within, within seconds or minutes, um, depending on what you want to look at. And uh, if you're interested in more, more, more demos or use cases from SafeGraph data, I definitely encourage you to check out our blog. Um, we, we put a lot of great content on there. You also can use the blog to find our post about the AWS Data Exchange, which links to the, the, the notebook. Um, and also, again, feel free to use this coupon code uh, to get, to get um, some free data if you want to play with it. Um, and obviously, we're happy to get, get you bigger samples if, if you need a bigger sample to look at something. So um, that's sort of, the, that's sort of the, the, the end of our content. Um, we wanted to put up this slide here to sort of just call out some, some call to actions for you uh, depending on what you're interested in. So, so obviously there's some great resources to, to, to get into Databricks. If you're new to Databricks, 
Um, if you're if you're experienced with Databricks, but you're new to the, data, the, the AWS data exchange, then um, encourage you to check that out. And then some logs, some some links here for SafeGraph, depending on what you're interested in. Um, super encourage you to check those out as well. Um, I think we have some time now at the end for questions, uh, and uh, I'll open it back up to that and and welcome Brian back into the conversation here. Yeah, this is great, Ryan. Really, really awesome presentation, and I've gotten a lot of comments here where people really appreciate what you've covered and, and how you covered it. I love the the humility around the you know don't make the same mistakes as me, but uh, but I think that's really powerful to understand not just what the mistakes were, but kind of your thought process and how you you know kind of moved along and and uh, rethought the problem at each step of the way is just fascinating. So that's, that's really 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 super valuable. Um, let me make a comment on the slide that you have up here uh, real quick. Um, so there's a couple of different links. One is uh, to be able to go and just try Databricks, which gets you a 14-day trial. So that's you know one thing you'll want to do, especially as you bring together uh, the notebook uh, that we have that integrates the SafeGraph data. Uh, but that's just the fastest way to get up and going with a really powerful platform and data set. Um, the second one, Databricks on AWS, is just a page that talks about the relationship of Databricks and AWS, talks through um, some of the messaging, and then also has uh, a number of different links to um, other customer stories. There's some really great webinars on there and stuff, and so you can see some of the things that other folks are doing. Um, the data exchange link takes you to uh, some more data or more information about the data exchange. So, um, but clearly, you know, the blog is one of the key things to visit. Um, so as I turn to some of the questions, Ryan, one in particular, I'm going to kind of paraphrase a little bit. Um, there was a specific question about how do I figure out, for instance, um, where I might put a school. And I think that that, if we kind of abstract that question for a second, um, you know, one of the key skills of a data scientist, I think, is really puzzle solving. Um, and if somebody comes to you with, you know, a particular industry, whether it's, you know, a location for a school or a gas station or, or other things, I guess one of the key things that you kind of have to think about is what are the, uh, not quite predictor variables, but what are the associated things that might help me to decide that this is a good place for that? Can you talk a little bit through kind of that thought process that you apply um, to, to any of these problems? Totally. Yeah, no, totally. That's, that's an awesome example. Um, and it's been fun, you know, for me to learn a lot more about sort of real estate and, 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 and site selection um, considerations since, since so many of our customers work on those types of problems. Um, I can say a few sort of generic things, and, and uh, I, I haven't specifically thought about schools before, but I think it's an interesting, interesting question. Um, I think, so one of the interesting things about that I always have to sort of start with and remind myself about when you're making real estate decisions is that um, the, 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 the opportunity space is not like a uniform opportunity, right? That there are, you, you can't go buy any real estate and put a school anywhere. <laughs> Um, so usually people are starting from a position of uh, they have some candidate places that, 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 they, that, they're, that they're looking at. Um, and those come from things like what real estate are available, what is our budget, what is our square footage requirements, uh, and th things like that. Um, so, so usually there's, there's sort of candidates that you're considering. Um, and most people who are doing this already have fairly sophisticated processes for, for trying to model how successful that location is going to be. Um, I, I'm most experienced with sort of the retail world, uh, and so people have models. Um, you know, sort of. You, you can imagine doing things like just what is the what is the overall population density within a 30 minute drive time of this place, and assuming that this population is similar to other populations, then what sort of traffic should we expect? Things like that. Uh, I think where the SafeGraph data really adds value to those processes is. Um, you know, a lot of people have first-party data about their own locations, right? They, they, maybe they're tracking, uh, they're, they're collecting data on their customers from loyalty programs or, you know, when you, when you transact and you enter your zip code, things like that. But almost no one has good data about their competitors or the other businesses in their area. And so SafeGraph gives you the opportunity to not only look at, you know, your own customers and, and traffic to your own places for which you might already have some incomplete picture about, um, but also to look at, complementary businesses or, or competitive businesses. Um, I can also say that, you know, for example, uh, SafeGraph data doesn't have sort of residential POI, but we do have other types of relevant things like parks um, or, or, or sort of public places. 
Um, and so I can imagine things like that might also factor into, uh, you know, where you might want to put a school. Um, we, we do, we do try to have schools in the data set. So, uh, you would, you'd be able to see where the other schools are, where, you know, public and private, things like that. Um, but again, I'm, I'm sort of at this point, sort of just talking off the top of my head, but I, but that's sort of the framework that we think about. Um, so hopefully that was like a little helpful. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I and mean, you know, as you think about something like a, a setting up an after school program or something, Certainly you want to be you know, near the schools, but quite often uh, they're in a residential neighborhood where you don't have access to actually start a business. And so then you're trying to figure out, well, where are the nearby, you know, kind of business zones, you know, how's the parking, what, you know, what are other folks doing in that space in terms of like after school, you know, traffic and, and our families going there and stuff. So I think there's a lot totally. of interesting puzzle solving that goes into each of these problems besides just being able to work the data. And I think that's, you know, what's really fun about the role. Um, so, okay, totally. good. So uh, a couple of other questions. Um, let's see. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, encoding features uh, for the preference learning model? Maybe even, you know, just talk a little bit about what that entails and, and, um, mm -hmm. and how you did it. Sure. Totally. Um, yeah, it, I, I hadn't worked on like a preference learning model before, so it's kind of interesting. Um, so I, I, the, the intuition is that we wanted to try to capture features that, right? So let's take a step back. Like we started by like looking at a bunch of data with our with our human eyes and trying to figure out like with our human brains, can we figure out where these visits are? <laughs> um, and and we found ourselves doing a lot of things like trying to calculate distances between. Uh, you know, are these points closer to this business or another business? So that, that feels sort of obvious that we would want to encode some distance features. And ultimately, I think we ended up using two, dis two distance-related features, one of which is the distance from each POI to the center of the cluster, and then the second, which is the distance of the POI to the closest GPS point of the cluster. Um, so, so we have a couple of distance sort of geospatial things like that. Um, and then, I, as I mentioned, we also do some sort of time of day things. So, uh, you know, if it's a bar... Um, we know that it has a different type of visit pattern during the day than if it's a grocery store. Uh, and we were able to sort of build those features from, from looking at lots of examples. Um, so we sort of have a time of day by category feature. Um, there's more features, but the, the, the way that the, the, the sort of learning to rank model works is that um, the, the, we look at all of them as pairs. So each, each, each POI sort of has its features. Each pair of POI has two vectors that we then, uh, we just take the difference between them. So we subtract the two vectors uh, and see uh, that that gives us a single vector that we consider sort of the, the feature vector for that pair. Uh, and then each pair gets labeled with um, three, three possible truth labels. So either if you have a pair A and B, uh, either A can be the, the correct one and B is the non-correct one. Uh, B can be the correct one, and A is the incorrect one, or both of them can be the incorrect one, right? So if you know you have six businesses, only one of them is correct. Most of those pairs are going to be um, both incorrect. Uh, and so to train the model, we threw out all of the uh, neutral pairs, so all of the ones where both are incorrect, and we only trained on examples where one of the two pairs was the, was the correct one. Um, and and again, our feature vector was just sort of the difference between those two individual features. Um, this is kind of in the weeds, but but I think that uh, that's sort of how the model was structured, and then and then you, and then it produces sort of a, a ranking for each POI, um, and then you can sort of rank them uh, in retrospect by saying, okay, who who won each pairwise competition? That sort of gives you a ranking within each, and then and then we, and then you just choose the highest ranked one. That's great. I, I think that's the kind of stuff people are trying to understand. So that's that's a great answer. Um, awesome. One other thing I wanted to point out to everyone: we do have a lot of questions that we're not going to get to. Um, but we're going to put together a blog post and put it out next week um, to kind of take some of these questions and, and uh, drill into them a little bit further. So look for that um, as a way to follow up. Also, um, our teams will be calling out to you uh, next week to reach out. Uh, there will be Spark experts on the phone, folks who can help you understand things like you know, sizing and you know, how to solve some of these types of problems and can really you know, dive into your use case. Um, so that'll be a great opportunity to really get some some one on one. Um, but this has been great, and I just really wanted to thank you, Ryan, for sharing all of your expertise and knowledge. Uh, I, I see so many comments here where people have have said thank you and the questions, you know, for the presentation. So great job! Really appreciate you participating here. 
Well, thank you so much. Yeah, like I said, it, uh, it's been it's been really fun and an honor to get to be here. And uh, we're huge fun, huge fans of Databricks. So um, yeah, again, everyone out there, if, if if we can help you with anything, would love to love to connect. Excellent. Okay, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. Uh, as I mentioned, you will get a recording of this. Um, you can talk to our folks as they reach out and get slides and, and then look for the blog post. And at this point, we'll go ahead and uh, conclude our, our webcast for today. Uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon.